Um, I'm just going to put a little marker here. Well, hey, Annie, it's it's uh, good to see you again. Uh, I know that we've spoken a couple of times in the past, but uh, this time I'm really excited because you're an expert on a particular form of therapy that I've used before and had tremendous benefits from it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wanted to bring you on and chat so that we could do a deep dive on EMDR, um, which I think a lot of people, you know, from my experience, there's very, there's so many people that aren't aware of this form of, of therapy. And I just want to talk about it because, uh, like I said, it's been so helpful to me and I just want to make it more known and readily available to folks. So thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. It's an absolute honor to be here. And I think you and I have the same goal. I wish more people did know about EMDR because it's an extraordinary healing tool. And so I'm very happy to be here and share whatever I can with your audience. Great. Well, to, to get things started then, uh, would you take a few minutes and just share your background and how you got into the work that you're doing today? Of course, I'm happy to. By way of introduction, of course, I'm Annie Wright. I'm a licensed psychotherapist. I'm also an EMDR certified clinician, very specifically a relational trauma therapist. And I, in addition to my own clinical work, I own and run a boutique trauma-informed therapy center here in Berkeley called Evergreen Counseling. Though, of course, we see clients all up and down California. In addition to that, I'm also a mental health writer and an online course creator. Every bit of my work in the world, including my direct clinical work with EMDR, is centered around helping those who come from relational trauma backgrounds move forward, heal the trauma in their past, and have as beautiful a, a, an adulthood as possible. And of course, like so many therapists, what's professional is personal. I became a psychotherapist, specifically a trauma therapist, because I myself come from a relational trauma background, um, a pretty extensive background of childhood trauma. And in the course of trying to overcome and heal the impacts of my past, which really began after I graduated from Brown, it was in my 20s that I started my journey, it was psychotherapy, specifically trauma-informed psychotherapy that finally helped me stabilize, truly process my trauma and grieve my past, and learn all the developmental tools and deficits I'd missed out on. I experienced such a profound transformation from my own personal psychotherapy that it made me want to, in turn, train as a trauma therapist so I could offer the same kind of transformation, relief, and hope to others who came from backgrounds like I do. Um, it was the most meaningful career path I could imagine, and still to this day, I can't believe how lucky I am to do this for a living. And with regards to EMDR and why I trained in that particular modality, it's again because of personal reasons. I first experienced EMDR when I was looking for support healing the birth trauma I experienced with my daughter. And I had such a profoundly positive experience with EMDR that I then went on to train in it and ultimately become certified because I wanted to have a really powerful uh, proverbial power tool in my trauma treatment toolbox as a clinician. And EMDR is without a doubt, a very powerful, powerful trauma treatment tool. Gotcha. And, and just for, for the folks that are listening and for, a few definitions. Why don't we start first with when you when you mentioned relational trauma, mm. uh, what, how is that defined from your perspective? As I define it, relational trauma is the kind of trauma that takes place in the course of a caregiving relationship that can be with um, a parent or another caregiver. It's really a kind of relationship where there's a power imbalance, and it's the kind of trauma that takes place over the course of time, not just one single moment, but over a protracted uh, period of time. And it usually results in a host of biopsychosocial deficits for the individual who experiences the trauma. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so is that a bit distinct from, say, uh, I don't know what the, the technical term is, but say uh, trauma that may come from uh, like a car accident or an unexpected event? Yes. Yes, it is. I mean, uh, I think the terms we could use interchangeably with uh, relational trauma would be childhood trauma, developmental trauma, attachment trauma. And those are all what we would call sort of complex, complex protracted traumas, whereas mm -hmm. A car crash or um, a, a rape or a near drowning incident in the trauma space, we call those single incident traumas. Now, it's not to say that folks who um, experience single incident traumas also don't necessarily, I mean, they could come from uh, mm -hmm. protracted complex trauma backgrounds as well, and that can even aggregate aggravate that trauma even more. But there is a difference um, when we talk about trauma, single incident versus protracted. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And that, the, uh, 
that that's helpful. And so the, the protracted that, that sounds familiar because that was what yeah. got me into, to EMDR as well. It's really sort of uh, specific relationships in particular with my mom and, yeah. and uh, some of the more difficult experiences as a kid, especially surrounding her death. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's where I did most of my EMDR work mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it was tremendously beneficial. So, I'm so uh, glad. that said, um, well, let's start with the basics. What is EMDR? How is this thing discovered and how does it work? Absolutely. So EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's a bit of a mouthful. So we say EMDR. EMDR therapy was created by Dr. Francine Shapiro um, in the late 80s, or rather, I should say, discovered by Dr. Francine Shapiro. And it's now a widely researched evidence-based and neuroscience-informed structured integrative therapy that reduces distressing emotional symptoms from a multitude of challenging life experiences, including isolated and protracted traumatic experiences, as well as addictions, phobias, and more. So how does it work? Well, using bilateral stimulation, be it eye movements, alternating auditory sounds, or bilateral physical sensations, such as with hand buzzers, and utilizing a discrete eight-phase protocol, EMDR works with and aids your brain's natural impulse to synthesize and metabolize maladaptive memories, behaviors, and beliefs that are creating distress and getting in the way of you living a functional life. The goal with EMDR is to get in touch with the maladaptively stored feelings, thoughts, and memories that lie at the root of our trigger responses, and the goal through processing is ultimately to move through these feelings and thoughts until we reach a place of zero disturbance when recalling the trauma memory or experience. That somatic resolution combined with the neurological processing of other trauma memories in the same memory channel is what reduces the symptomology in our present day lives. Mm -hmm. To put it plainly, EMDR simply helps your brain and body do what it naturally wants to do, which is move towards healing by getting what's in the way of healing out of the way. Gotcha. Yeah. And I, I was reading into uh, some of the history of how uh, Dr. Shapiro discovered it. And it was yeah. fascinating. And from, yeah. from what from what I recall, she was uh, out on routine walks mm -hmm. and noticed that for some odd reason that if she happened to be thinking about something that was distressing, for example, her own prior life experiences that might've been difficult for her. Mm -hmm. She noticed that while on her walk, her eyes naturally scanning the environment, that there was something about the movement of the eyes that somehow just seemed to like lessen the, the, the anxious response that she was feeling when recalling those memories. Exactly. And you know, it, it's, it's fascinating because as I've, I've dug into the origin of many of today's uh, clinical practices, um, the, the originators of a lot of the methods were basically human guinea pigs. <laughs> she, it, it was, it was, yeah. She just, she said, what, like, there's something interesting here. Yeah. So let me try yeah. this more on my own and see what happens. Exactly. Exactly. And then of course she started with a small cohort of test subjects and that grew over time. So this sort of spontaneous healing experience that she had on her walk when she noticed her eye movements were spontaneously moving. And then after they did that, when she was holding that disturbing thought in mind that she wasn't as bothered by that thought, she went on to test this again and mm -hmm. again and again. It's really, it is a very cool story. I, I love yeah. that. Yeah. I remember one of the initial case studies was with a veteran at one of the local veteran mm -hmm. facilities. And, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, one of the anecdotes that I read in this, in this old interview she gave mm -hmm. that really caught my attention is at first it was, uh, EMD, you know, yes. it, it was this notion that she noticed the, the randomized eye movements and then that it would provide this sort of calming or soothing effect where it would dial mm -hmm. the volume down on whatever, uh, anxiety she was feeling, yes. but then in working with military veteran and more of the cohorts of people that she worked with, she noticed that not only it, it wasn't just a symptom reduction technique, that mm -hmm. there was something much deeper there, which is the reprocessing part. Correct. Or then it became EMD to EMDR. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how it's evolved. Um, and that's completely accurate. So it's not just symptom reduction, but it's 
truly trauma relieving in that sense when you add in the reprocessing. Yeah, it's a really extraordinary modality and truly the effect it has on my clients are, I mean, it's profound. Mm -hmm. So related to that, specifically the reprocessing part, how do you describe what the experience of an EMDR session is like for somebody and what it enables them to do from a reprocessing standpoint? Oh, such a great question. So I can answer this both as somebody who has received EMDR and someone who is a clinician who has applied it to hundreds of clients. Perfect. Okay. Um, you start, you can start an EMDR session. And of course, EMDR has a phases of standard protocol. And so in the first couple of phases, you're not necessarily doing memory reprocessing. But when you get there, when you get to that stage and you begin doing memory reprocessing, your clinician has um, gathered all of the traumatic memories and the associated memories that they think might inform your um, treatment plan. And you begin the session by actually activating the traumatic memory. You do that through a combination of visuals, somatic sensations, uh, cognitive um, beliefs, negative cognitive beliefs, uh, rating the scale of disturbance in your body. Your clinician is, of course, leading you through all of this. So, and, and these questions that we use are designed to really, truly activate that both in your body and your mind so we can effectively light up the neural pathways that are associated with this trauma memory. Then your clinician begins to lead you through the desensitization and reprocessing part, utilizing that bilateral stimulation again, whether it's eye movements, auditory tones, or hand buzzers, you're actually experiencing that bilateral stimulation while holding that traumatic memory in, in your mind and allowing your body and your brain to do what it naturally wants to do, which is synthesize and metabolize the memory. Now this could, you know, um, and result in a lot of funny different things like random spontaneous thoughts or uh, a deepening of anger or a deepening of fear before you feel relief. Um, but ultimately your clinician is leading you with again, advanced protocols and through standard protocols to a point where you feel zero disturbance by the end of the session, or at least greatly reduced by the end of the session. Um, and then you started the session with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, you know, recalling when I first started EMDR, to provide uh, a, a, a living example of that process. Mm. Uh, it, it began, and this is, I think, in uh, 2011. Oh, uh, yeah. It began with my therapist and I sort of listing out a handful of scenarios or memories that uh, were the most distressing to me. Yes. Uh, one of them in, in particular that we chose to focus on was uh, there was an evening when I was young, um, probably somewhere around eight or so, where uh, my mother, unfortunately, at the time, uh, attempted suicide. And she had done so with, with a lot of pills. And for one reason or another, I think it was just a mistake on the medical staff. But while mm -hmm. at the hospital, I actually saw her in her in the hospital room while the physicians were attempting to pump her stomach. And it was just an mm -hmm. awful, awful scene. Yeah. And I just went blank after that. Mm -hmm. I don't remember anything, mm -hmm. yeah. but I, that memory itself was responsible for an awful lot of the specific triggers that I had as an individual. Sure. Uh, for example, reading the word, um, uh, suicide, or mm -hmm. even at times reading or hearing the word mom was mm -hmm. enough to mm -hmm. trigger a panic, panic attack in me. Mm -hmm. And it was all rooted back in that experience. And so when I went through EMDR with, uh, with my therapist, you know, it began with about 20 minutes or so of, I was using the paddles in both hands that are vibrating, mm -hmm. al uh, alternating, yeah. and then I had headphones that were playing alternating tones. Yeah. I recall myself becoming very relaxed, mm -hmm. um, not in like a hypnotized state, just in, mm -hmm. in more of like a meditative, mm -hmm. very calm, um, accessible state. Mm. And then my therapist talked me through revisiting that memory. Mm -hmm. and, and then at the right point in time, we basically incepted a new perspective mm. on that memory. Mm -hmm. So instead of me, like first I reapproached that awful scene of me seeing my dog, my, my mom in the hospital fighting with the doctors and what have you. Mm -hmm. 
it was then I imagined her there in the hospital, mm -hmm. but she was there for say cancer. She was being mm -hmm. treated. She mm -hmm. was nearing end of life, but mm -hmm. it was an opportunity for me to enter that room mm -hmm. and instead speak with and connect with my mom in a way that then just gave me a much warmer feeling related mm -hmm. to that prior memory. And mm -hmm. so it's not that the memory disappears. The memory is still there. No, no. That's but, actually a really important misconception to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just the way I describe it is that the memory is still there. I can still recall it. Yeah. It's just that when I recall it now, that memory isn't attached to these really negative, visceral, immediate emotions huh. that, that it used to come with. And that was that was the benefit of it. I I want to start by just acknowledging that I'm really sorry you had to go through that. No, no child ever should. And I'm also really glad you found EMDR and you found a therapist skilled enough to help support you processing that. And that is exactly why we're here today. That's why we're talking about EMDR. And I think it's, you know, this is an opportunity to talk about one of the big misconceptions about EMDR. I mean, I think a lot of people have that sort of um, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind fantasy, like <laughs> yeah. the lobotomy fantasy, right? It's like, I will make all these memories. Go away. <laughs> right. No, we, we don't do that. And also it's not hypnosis either. We, you know, we're not going to make you feel or believe something that's not true. If you come in and the idea is like, help me love my husband, but you're actually, you know, done loving your husband and you really want a divorce. Well, we work through the fears related to that divorce. Like we can't make somebody forget or feel a way they, you know, uh, or, or think a way they truly don't. Um, but what we can do with EMDR is again, decouple the trauma from these sort of triggers that it might have become associated with in our young minds, right? Or our older minds and work through the level of disturbance somatically and psychologically that we have about the memory and the attendant triggers. Yeah. Um, so I'm really glad you got to experience that. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, and that, and that's, I think that's the way I try and summarize it to folks is that sort of the core mechanism is we have thoughts. Mm -hmm. Those thoughts tend to trigger an emotional response. The mm -hmm. emotional response can then lead to behaviors. For example, in the past, if I was triggered by, you know, hearing the word suicide, mm -hmm. it would then create this immediate panic sensation inside of me, yeah. which then because I was feeling panic, I would look for whatever I could to just numb that feeling. Yeah. You know, maybe it was have a drink or smoke something or whatever it is. Yeah. And by then severing or weakening that negative emotional response to it, I think you greatly improve your ability to then intercept that process and then control the negative behaviors that may follow it. And that's, that's what was so powerful for me. Absolutely. And, you know, I also think this is important that we, we talk about how a lot of clients can work backwards when it comes to EMDR. And what I mean by that is this, you know, sometimes people have no idea what's at the root of them obsessively gaming or watching porn compulsively or drinking too much or having too many edibles or, you know, going into a panic attack when they see their boss's name in the email inbox. Like they just know, here's the symptom. This symptom's getting in the way of my life. I'm ruining my relationships. I want relief from it. Mm without an idea that somehow that's connected to an unprocessed trauma memory. So very often it's, it's way more common for people to come into my offices and into the center knowing, Hey, like these are the things that are getting in the way of me living my life. Can we please work on them? And in the course of a very thorough and complete clinical uh, intake and history taking, we start to understand and piece together a little bit like detectives, what might be at the root of some of those symptoms that are so distressing. Mm. And then related to that, I would imagine that most people are, are candidates for something like EMDR, but are, mm -hmm. are there certain populations where it's not recommended? I appreciate this question so, so much because EMDR is a very powerful brain-based psychotherapy and some cases are more nuanced than others. So I want to give a really nuanced answer to that question. Um, first, I do want to say that there are some cases where proceeding directly into memory reprocessing, or rather even early into memory reprocessing is contraindicated and really clinically inappropriate. Mm -hmm. 
Um, these might be cases where there's a high level of destabilization for that person, maybe active substance uh, use or abuse or structural disassociation of the personality, among many variables that um, would make proceeding with memory reprocessing too destabilizing and potentially harmful to the client. But in these cases, even though proceeding with EMDR reprocessing early on is not clinically indicated, and remember, memory reprocessing is only one stage of the eight-stage protocol, mm -hmm. A well-trained EMDR clinician can apply advanced protocols and interventions to help stabilize the client first, ensure a really sufficient amount of internal stability is present, such as in the form of developing ego strength, personality integration, affect access, and emotional regulation. Um, and we, we call all that work an extended preparatory period. And it really is actually only the second phase of EMDR. It's just that in some cases, we can go through this quite quickly with clients, and in other cases, it last longer. Hmm. So to answer your question in a nuanced way, most people can be a candidate for EMDR um, and we can actually begin the eight phase EMDR protocol with nearly every client. It's just that we may not get to the actual memory reprocessing for some time with some clients, depending on the case. Now, finally, um, there are other cases where uh, some might argue that EMDR is not appropriate. For instance, it's a bit of a, a live wire in the clinical community, but many clinicians won't conduct EMDR with um, pregnant clients because of the mm. paucity of research we have about the impacts on the developing fetus. And again, some clinicians challenge that stance and will do EMDR in pregnant clients, citing adequate information to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and then certainly in some cases where there are traumatic brain injuries, TBIs, um, EMDR candidacy will likely need medical sign-off, uh, not to mention a more advanced EMDR clinician with a specialty to treat complex cases. Mm. But, you know, I, I hope that this is a nuanced answer um, that shines a light on saying most people are candidates for EMDR. Mm. Absolutely. And I'm really curious in, in the, the current discussion regarding um, a woman who's pregnant, yeah. is the concern that, let's say in that scenario, um, they then go into the reprocessing part Potentially the client enters a heightened period of emotional response and maybe their nervous system is kicking into fight or flight mode. And is the concern that then uh, the, the hormones and the molecules and everything that's released in response to the mother re-encountering some of the trauma is then passed um, into the child in, in, in vivo? Is that right? Yeah. You, you are spot on and very smart, Andy. Um, yes, that is absolutely a concern, right? We, <clears throat> we know the developing fetus feels mom stress. And I'm going to counter argue with this, right? Mm -hmm. If a woman comes to me and she's pregnant with her second child and, you know, her first child was a, um, she had extensive birth trauma, postpartum trauma, and she's, she's, she wants the second child, but she's absolutely terrified. But the reality is that woman is already feeling stress in her body. She is already passing on those stress mm -hmm. hormones to the baby because of the unresolved unprocessed trauma from last time. So, you know, it's really, it's a consent question. Um, giving a client adequate information to make an informed consent um, is really important. I don't think that pregnancy is, pregnancy is not, um, a, you know, it's not a rule out. Personally, as a clinician, I will work with pregnant clients. I will do so after the 20 week anatomy scan and with medical mm -hmm. um, sign off by their OB. Um, Cause I personally think that we sometimes do moms a disservice by not applying EMDR when they are experiencing that unprocessed trauma in the course of their pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes a, a lot of sense. And it's, it, I, I would agree it's, it's for somebody who with a PTSD diagnosis, you know, the, yeah the the threat to the body is already there in terms of the flooding of mm -hmm. stress hormones mm -hmm. um, and if anything sure there may be this momentary period of 45 minutes where that stress is increased but it creates the potential for um for real healing which yeah. i'm sure the 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 baby would also benefit from that not only in in the womb but <laughs> everywhere thereafter I, uh, hmm. Again, I'm I'm not an MD, but as a as a trauma clinician, I absolutely agree with you. Gotcha. Um, and then, what about for the younger population, for children or teenagers? 
Oh yeah, definitely. EMDR is so useful for um, kiddos and teenagers. It really is impactful with um, all ages of clients. And what's also true is that for children, especially the really little kiddos, as EMDR clinicians, we do need to tailor our approach in ways that we um, wouldn't normally do with our adult clients. And so that might uh, involve, and that might include involving a parent or a caretaker in the history taking, um, just given children's limited ability to self-report and remember things accurately. Mm. We might limit the actual reprocessing time of EMDR to only 10 minutes, maybe 15, and then use the um, rest of the session for play therapy because kids can't tolerate it as long as adults can. And we might do fun things too, like use symbols or pictographs to help kids um, self-report on their experience and more. Um, but absolutely, EMDR can be incredibly useful for children and teenagers. And quite frankly, as a mom and a clinician, this delights me. I've, I've seen it um, <laughs> even with my own daughter. So it really does thrill gotcha. me. Gotcha. Uh, that's interesting. That, but that makes total sense to sort of configure the experience a little bit to a younger population. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's um, well, again, we, we always do when it comes to therapeutic interventions, right? This is why we have play therapy and child therapy, but EMDR can be adapted um, for kids uh, as young as, gosh, like toddlers. Uh, you know, mm. that's, that's where I've seen it, uh, the youngest I've seen it. But it's, it's incredibly powerful because their brains do what adult brains do. They yeah. want to move naturally towards healing. And um, they're so they're so primed to be responsive to it as well. Well, that, that actually brings up an interesting question for me. Is mm -hmm. I, I'm only familiar with EMDR being conducted at the level of the individual, you know, the patient mm -hmm. and the, the therapist. Right. Are there cases for or instances in which uh, pairs or groups of people would go through EMDR together? Oh, definitely. Oh gosh, I'm I'm probably. Um, I wish I could bring more citations to this conversation, but there's um, there are several wonderful organizations that conduct group EMDR in natural disaster settings. And in fact, one clinician, and again, I'm terribly sorry because I'm forgetting the name of the originator of the EMDR intervention called the butterfly hug, which I don't know if your clinician ever made you mm -hmm. do, but this is called the butterfly hug, just this alternating tapping on one shoulders, or you could do it on your knees, but really the idea is to create that bilateral stimulation. That was developed, I believe, specifically for a group who had experienced a natural disaster um, in a setting where, of course, they didn't have like a hundred, you know, light bars or paddles to hand out. Um, so absolutely, there are lots of cases where EMDR has been applied to, to group settings. Wow. Wow. What a, what an amazing use case too. Isn't that <laughs> incredible? Yeah, I hadn't considered that in the past, but that's uh, that's fantastic. Yes, um, I believe yeah. it's called the EMDR Humanitarian Assistance Program. I think that's okay. where it first showed up. Great, great. And then, uh, how about so so staying along the the vein of you know who's the ideal uh, client or patient mm -hmm. for this versus somebody who might might not be, um, and I'm I'm sure that this is an interesting conversation within the clinical world, but yeah. is it something that is sometimes recommended for people who may not necessarily meet a clinical diagnosable threshold? So for example, and correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but I think for the DSM-4, for major depression, there are, I think, nine different symptoms. Mm. And in order to meet the clinical threshold, I, I believe you have to experience at least five of them over some period of time. Um, but somebody may have four sure. <laughs> right? sure. or, well, I, the or DSM, three. <laughs> yeah, of course. And the DSM-5 is our current diagnostic uh, statistical manual of mental disorders, um, which is the, you know, sort of like the bedrock Bible, diagnostic mm -hmm. Bible we mental health clinicians use. So I'm just saying that for the benefit of your audience. So DSM-5 is what we currently use, and it's it's wonderful. It's a wonderful starting place, and certainly clinicians who bill insurance need to use it. Yeah. Um, I want to I want to be really clear. Clients don't need to experience severe symptoms to benefit from EMDR. They don't need to hit every single one of those um, diagnostic criteria in order to benefit. I know I've shared some maybe severe symptoms in the course of talking together, but I do want to state that EMDR can be incredibly helpful when someone is experiencing subclinical measures of anxiety or depression, meaning low levels, right? And or if they don't necessarily identify as coming from a trauma background or having had trauma happen to them, 
maybe instead they have a very sound and stable platform um, that they want to take from good to great. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to, to name just, you know, for the benefit of your audience and, you know, for everybody that high performing, high functioning individuals can also really greatly benefit from EMDR. Mm -hmm. In fact, and this is a really interesting part about EMDR that I love, we can work in three prongs with EMDR, past, present, and future. Um, and in my work with founders, co-founders, and really accomplished individuals in tech, I often work in the future prong of the EMDR, helping them improve their professional performance by reducing anticipatory anxiety, the, feel of, uh, the fear of failure, mm. working through imagined future procrastination and setbacks, and improving confidence about future endeavors. So these high-performing individuals can then complete work tasks more successfully without being influenced by past negative beliefs or um, physiological responses. So again, to answer your question, if you don't identify with meeting the criteria for um, a, an actual diagnosis, or if you don't identify as coming from a trauma background, you you don't have to have acute symptoms to benefit from EMDR. Uh, EMDR mm -hmm. is widely applicable to, to many people. Okay, that's fascinating. Uh, I hadn't considered the future case. So mm -hmm. to make sure mm -hmm. I, I get this right, so let's say you're an entrepreneur, Sure. You've, you've raised a couple million bucks from investors. Mm -hmm. uh, you're working, working, working. You're stressed out for all sorts of, of understandable reasons. But then one of the part, uh, one of the forms of, of stress that can be substantial is they may be thinking about, okay, three months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now, mm -hmm. I still have to meet these milestones because I'm beholden to my investors mm -hmm. to perform well. And yes. so it's this, this future fear that I'm actually experiencing presently exactly. and it's persistent. Yes. And yes. so it's having an effect on me similar to a prior experience that I'm still feeling a present pain with. Is mm -hmm. that, is that right? Yeah. So if this was a client, this is a very common client who shows up in my offices. <laughs> right. um, Sounds like me. <laughs> Sounds like me. <laughs> You're easy, easy. Yeah. I mean, we're, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a, I've been a therapist in Silicon Valley for quite some time. Yeah. Mm, if I were working with this client in the course of doing a really thorough clinical intake, I would be looking for any historical data points, right? Historical experiences where <clears throat> let's say things went wrong, right? Or where there were, if not necessarily traumatic memories, memories in the past that were still causing distress, um, that were, you know, feeling hard and contributing to that anticipatory anxiety that that in individual felt about whatever was coming up in the future. We always work through the historical events first, reducing distress mm -hmm. around those. And then in the second half of my work with that individual, once we've gone through all of those memories when the distress is no longer present, when they call to mind any of those past events, what we're doing then is we're moving into the future prong of EMDR. And I think the best way to think about this is to think of the kind of, um, almost like visualization that uh, coaches do with their Olympic athletes, right? It's like 99% of the work takes place, you know, before they step on the starting line, you see yourself winning, right? Um, we use the future prong of EMDR to um, anticipate what that is going to be like six, 10, 18 months from now. We walk them through that scenario, attending to each little piece that could potentially create anxiety, reducing the anxiety, reducing the distress when they go into the future thinking about it. So that they're more prepared when the time actually comes to perform at their peak performance in those moments. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. And then it, EMDR is primarily uh, used for patients experiencing or clients experiencing anxiety, depression, potentially some addictions. Is, is that, is that the, the general set of, of uh, conditions in which it's used or are there other conditions that it applies to as well? Yes and no. <clears throat> I think the majority of individuals with unresolved trauma backgrounds have symptoms that manifest as anxiety or depression symptoms. So those are sort of like the two big buckets that, you know, people come to us for, but mm -hmm. addiction, phobias, um, mm -hmm. night terrors, flashbacks, uh, there's an endless uh, amount, a wide variety of symptoms that people uh, seek EMDR treatment with. I mean, some others that maybe, you know, seem really innocuous and in everyday flight anxiety, um, or, you know, even, um, 
I don't know, like the fear of vomiting or fear of riding in elevators or gosh knows here in the East Bay, at least the fear of the BART going, you know, under the ocean. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anxiety, depression, phobias, addictions. Um, But really, if there's a trigger that's creating distress in your life, there's a high likelihood that EMDR is appropriate uh, to be applied to it. And then across whether it's uh, demographics or if it's different um, traumatic experiences or it's different clinical diagnoses, do do you observe or is there clinical literature regarding where EMDR may or may not be more effective? So for example, Mm -hmm. um, I came across one study, I'm I'm blanking on the, the authors of it, so I'll have to look this up, but they, observed that across different uh, ethnicities that the effectiveness of EMDR, it was a bit more variable. Um, And and the general hypothesis around it was that, you know, they would go and and do the sessions, but then still the home environment and the cultural environment or the neighborhood they were in was still so influential that Mm -hmm it may imply or suggest Mm. that that person may need more sessions or, Mm. you know, something else to go along with it. Um, That's so interesting. Um, First of all, you know, please send me the link to that study, but this just kind of reminds me sort of more broadly of like the effectiveness of therapy in, um, you know, as applied in a dominantly sort of um, white, field to individuals who maybe are of color or come from very diverse backgrounds. I mean, this, I don't think this is a conversation then just around like EMDR being um, Mm -hmm. helpful for some population groups and not others. I think it's a a question of um, therapy in general, right. Being helpful, more helpful for some population groups than others. And I think then we have to look at the cultural context of what is the demographic of the clinician and what is the demographic of the client? What are the sort of um, structural and social elements for that client? Um, You know, it's certainly, there are certain cultures in the world, Asian cultures, Latino cultures, uh, Latin cultures, et cetera, that place a heavier emphasis on um, family systems than let's say maybe like, um, you know, Caucasian clients, uh, you know, family Mm -hmm. systems do. And those, those become sort of structural barriers that we have to work within. Right. And so Mm -hmm. to your point, um, can EMDR be helpful? You know, if, if you're a white clinician delivering it to a person of color and that person of color exists in a system where there are limiting um, beliefs around what's possible uh, in home and, and socially, can EMDR still be helpful? Yes. Will the sort of social and demographic and, um, you know, even the, the relational interplay between the clinician and client have to be addressed in order to support that work? Definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's true of every single therapy, I think. Yeah. 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 Agreed. And it's, it's one of the reasons why when I talk to folks and they say, Hey, I'm thinking about, uh, getting a therapist, who do you recommend? Or, you know, it, I give them a series of pointers. And one of them I recommend is if you can find a therapist that understands your context. Yes. Um, you know, for example, in Silicon Valley, it's sure. If you can find a therapist who's been an entrepreneur, or mm-hmm. who has worked yeah. with a lot of entrepreneurs. That's really helpful. <laughs> it's really there helpful. Because the therapist who runs her very large therapy center as yeah. a case of entrepreneurs. Yeah, it, it is helpful, right? Because there are certain cultural pieces um, that are really important to understand the stresses and strains of certain you know, uh, life choices, et cetera, right? And also, you know, it's very important for some clients, and I'm, I'm speaking anecdotally because I have a staff of 21 at my therapy center. We see 400 clients a week. Wow. You know, some clients will only work with um, clinicians who are moms because mm-hmm. as much as they want to imagine they could be helped by a clinician who isn't a mom, there's a lived experience piece that they're looking for. So I think you, you do your, you do your friends or your community, a great service telling them to look for a therapist who, who really gets them because at the end of the day, and we know this from the research, the single factor that will make therapy successful is the therapeutic fit between the client and the therapist. And that is not necessarily saying the person has to be the exact same as you, but you do have to feel comfortable and you do have to feel safe and you have to feel some degree of mirroring. Is this person like me in some way? Do they get me? Yeah, that's a great point because retrospectively, when I think back to the relationship that 
have with my therapist who I've worked on and off with for a decade. Mm. It was actually great that uh, for me, I paired with, with a woman because, mm -hmm. you know, I lost the primary uh, yeah. female figure in my life when I was young. It was a tumultuous relationship before that. So, yeah. and, and I didn't grow up surrounded by women. I was mm. me, two brothers, my dad on a farm. <laughs> yeah, it, oh, it wasn't the most feminine yeah. environment. <laughs> right? exactly. exactly. And so that becomes this piece too, where it's like the reparative experience of not yes. only having like an attuned, caring uh, therapist, the reparative piece from having um, a mother figure and choosing a female mm -hmm. therapist. I, I can imagine that that was significant for you. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, she became the, the most important uh, female figure in my life who knows mm. more about me than anybody. You know? And that was part yeah. of the healing process. Yeah. I'm mm. so glad you had that experience. Yeah. She's awesome. So, um, okay. A few more questions here. Ah, th this one I'm interested in is, so let's say, um, you do a session with one of your clients. What do you advise the client does after the session? Is there, kind of an integration period like there is that's discussed in the world of psychedelic medicine is sure the, the session might've given you an insight that you didn't or, or connected the dots that you didn't see previously, but what you do after the session is what mm -hmm. helps it stick. Um, mm -hmm. And so is, is there sort of a similar framing around EMDR or is it more like, Hey, rest, recover, have fun, be around friends, just do something because you put in hard work. Now it's time mm. to, to chill a little bit. Mm. Well, I'm going to answer this question um, <clears throat> by speaking about, yes, what I recommend they do after the session, but also what they do before the session, mm. because kind of like, um, you know, a great workout begins with a great night of sleep, right? It's like the things that we do, you know, ahead of time actually add up to a good EMDR session that allows for like the adequate level of integration afterwards. So here are the guidelines I give and have my clients agree to. Um, I ask them not to use cannabis or any other consciousness impacting substances for 48 hours before and after sessions to allow their brain really the most optimal condition for the work. Um, I definitely don't let them show up to substance uh, to sessions um, intoxicated on substances because again, this is a brain-based psychotherapy. You're you know paying a lot of money if you're working with me or another clinician to um, experience this, and if your brain is um, altered, you're not going to get the best possible work, right? I also really, <clears throat> really recommend. If you're doing telehealth EMDR, you definitely need to be in a place where you have privacy should really strong, unexpected emotions come up. Um, and finally, make sure before the session you've met all your basic biological needs. You've had a little something to eat, you're hydrated, you don't need to pee too badly so that you can focus on the somatic sensations EMDR yeah. evokes, and sometimes they're subtle uh, without being distracted by those somatic sensations um, that unmet biological needs can evoke. So if you've done all that and you've arrived into your session and you've prepared yourself to really receive the work afterwards, what I tell my clients um, is this. Well, first of all, let me just say that EMDR is a very powerful modality as you yourself has, have experienced. Um, it works with your brain. Um, so it's normal and natural for clients to feel some level of impact after the session. It's not that they feel pain. I want to be very clear. It's not that you feel physical pain. It's just that you may sometimes feel tired, emotionally saturated, and sometimes even a little woozy and out of it. Clients describe it that way. Um, so because of this, I do counsel my clients not to plan anything after our sessions that require extensive exertion or cognitive capacity. You know, for instance, don't schedule uh, a staff meeting for your company in the <laughs> after your EMDR session where you may need to present. Um, and also don't hop in your car and race down the freeway, right? Where you yeah. need like you know, intense cognitive functioning. If it's all possible, take it easy. Allow yourself to come um, back to equilibrium and hydrate. Um, but then also integration for me happens in between the sessions when I ask my um my clients, I assign them basically EMDR weekly logs where they keep track of how many times their triggers and symptoms showed up during the week, what this looked like, and if there was any shift. So <clears throat> that is part of the integration process. We use these logs to track their progress against their clinical goals in between our sessions and when we next meet. So that's, that's how I work with integration. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And that, that's, to what you said about the effects afterwards, that's consistent with my experiences yeah. during the sessions. There was a lot of grieving 
and uh, just sort of an, an emotional outpouring. But afterwards, I just felt the sort of calm that you only feel after you empty the well of emotion yes. a bit. Oh, so <laughs> um, well said. So well yeah. Said. Where it's just like you put down a heavy boulder you've been carrying around. And all I wanted to do was eat a burrito and go to sleep. <laughs> and so that, I mean, very relatable, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, you, you get it, right? Like it's, it's an emotional kind of like ringing out. I mean, mm. you're most, and I'm speaking as somebody who has received EMDR. It's just like, you're kind of wiped at the end of the sessions, especially the early ones, especially yeah. the early ones. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the sessions I did later, uh, because at first I did a batch of like three or four sessions. And then several years later, when I'd identified another trigger, I did a couple more. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that as we sort of descended down the ladder of triggers that, yeah, it became less intensive experiences mm -hmm. and the recovery time afterwards was, yeah. was shortened. And, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I like to tell clients it's not always going to feel this hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll point this next question off of, you mentioned EMDR via telemedicine, and oh, yeah. that's one of the the things that came out of, I believe, the COVID era. Um, <laughs> and I, yeah. I actually connected with, and I'm going to have a, uh, another conversation with the founder of one of those telehealth EMDR companies. It's called uh, Zero Health, hmm. um, but it's it's uh, it's S E R O Zero Health. Okay. Um, Writing it down. Yeah, they even developed their own paddles and everything. It's, it's uh, yeah. um, started by somebody who he himself uh, received EMD, EMDR, experienced oh. the benefits of it, and said, I'm going to start this company. <laughs> um, Great. Great. But, but I'm curious on your thoughts, although it's it's new and, and emerging, but when you think about the, the differences or the pros and cons of in-person versus remote, how do you think about that as it as it applies to your practice? Oh, well, it's kind of all I've been doing since March, 2020. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad you're bringing this up because again, just as we're, you know, hopefully helping more people understand what EMDR actually is. I think technology and EMDR um, really levels the playing field and allows more people to actually experience it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll share that before 2020, I never practiced EMDR via telehealth, like the you know, bulk of clinicians. Yeah. Um, I only ever did it in person with my clients in my therapy center offices in downtown Berkeley. But, you know, along came 2020 and we all had to pivot, myself included. And it was at this time that I discovered a wonderful little product, you know, of hand buzzers, which were, um, you know, that could produce that alternating bilateral stimulation, something we normally would have experienced via the light bar or buzzers or earphones mm -hmm. from this equipment in my offices. But in discovering this product, my I found my clients could buy a pair of these buzzers and keep them in their homes. And in our sessions together, we calibrate the settings of the buzzers to, you know, have them be at the right pace and intensity for the stage of work we were in. And then we would conduct our EMDR, EMDR therapy sessions remotely. And honestly, to this day, I still do the bulk of my work remotely. I, I still go into my offices. Um, but since the bulk of my clientele is located primarily in Silicon Valley, LA, and Miami, um, they don't always have the ability to physically make it into my offices for sessions. Uh, and I genuinely, truly believe with, I mean, we're not even at three years yet, but it'll be three years soon. Um, I, I believe with three years of data under my belt that telehealth EMDR can be just as effective, if not more effective than in-person mm. EMDR. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Because think about it a couple different ways. It's like... Um, you know, a lot of people stop treatment too early because of, you know, the half an hour it takes to commute to the therapist's office, the 15 minutes of parking, and then like getting a babysitter for the kids or whatever. You know, it, it's actually made EMDR much more accessible to a wider range of clientele. Um, you know, I have founders or co-founders book sessions with me the morning before at 7 a.m., when they have, you know, a presentation at say 9 a.m., right? They wouldn't normally be able to do that if they were in person. So <laughs> I, I think it's, it's extraordinary. And, um, you know, there are some circumstances that, you know, would dictate whether or not remote or in person would be better. Um, I'll say telehealth EMDR is not indicated for every single client. You know, for example, if a client is very actively suicidal or has extensive mm. SI, suicidal ideation, they would likely be better served by a local in-person EMDR therapist who could, 
you know, quickly connect them to local crisis resources should mm. they compensate in the course of treatment. And, you know, other circumstances might make in-person EMDR more appropriate, um, you know, like such as if that person had privacy concerns that might exist in their home or if they didn't have strong enough Wi-Fi. But, you know, we all got so creative during the pandemic and I had clients <laughs> taking their EMDR sessions from their cars, right? Not on Wi-Fi, but, you know, streaming through their data plan to, mm. you know, be away from the kids. So telehealth EMDR is amazing. I really, That's really cool. like it. And um, along with this company you named, there's so many different products and um, apps available to support that work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just a great leveler uh, in terms of creating more and more access to EMDR. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I saw one of the companies, I think it was Zero Health, they even hacked it so that if you have an, I think it's a Nintendo Wii, uh, oh. Or it's one of the gaming uh, consoles that has haptic vibrations in it to where you can use your, your, the gaming console to, to do the wow. bilateral stimulation. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, oh, I was going to ask something related to mm -hmm. that. Oh, um, yeah, to your point of whether it's in person or remote, mm. um, I actually wonder if, men would skew more towards remote. And <laughs> the, the reason I say that is I, I've spent a lot of time, um, probably, I don't know, one or 200 hours in uh, different forms of group therapy or group social support with men. Yeah. And one of the common things, themes that I've noticed with men of, and this <laughs> won't be a shocker to people listening to this, is they have a hard time showing emotion, um, mm -hmm. especially in front of other people, especially in front of other people they don't know mm -hmm. or that they might feel mm -hmm. intimidated by. They don't want to show weakness. And so I, it's just a guess on my part that yeah. men would prefer remote in home because maybe it removes that social fear stigma. Well, I only have <laughs> anecdotal evidence here, but I will say that that checks out with my experience. <laughs> my intel. And you know, I say that with all the love in my heart, I really want to, I, I think men and boys are, are, are met with so many barriers to allowing themselves to feel and to safely feel and be witnessed when they feel. So you know, as, as much as we're chuckling about it, it's like, oh man, yeah, that's real. And so I do think that telehealth EMDR can be really helpful for many of my male clients. And in fact, I even go so far as to um, allow them to turn the video off or the audio, but I do need to keep, you know, eyes and tabs on them in some way, just to make sure that, you know, they don't go beyond their window of tolerance. Um, if turning video or sound off would help them feel more comfortable feeling the feelings that are coming up until our relationship is safer and more established and they feel more comfortable um, emoting in front of me. Um, so absolutely, I think that that is a, um, a very real variable and I appreciate you bringing it up actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was, I remember being in group therapy with other men and I'd arrived at the point where I was, I was comfortable crying in front of other people, but I would, mm -hmm. I would commonly be in the room sort of looking around and and I could see when a man was having an emotional moment and he would slowly kind of do this and yeah, you know, <laughs> and yeah. didn't oh, want it to be seen and yeah. I'd say, Hey, let it out. You know, and so much of their health was, or their healing, I think was, it was stunted or was minimized because they just couldn't get over that hill of just let it out. No one's judging you. It's okay. Well, it's kind of hard to feel that way when you grow up in a culture that says, be a man, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, boys don't cry, right? So it's like, yep. man, men and boys are up against so many barriers to, to undo, or at least I think older generations of men and boys are. Yep. Um, so I think it's it's beautiful that you were in that men's group. And I think the more that we can create space for men to feel um, the entire spectrum of emotions and ditto women too, uh, mm -hmm the physically healthier all of us will be and certainly the more socially and emotionally healthy, um, all yeah. of us will be. Yeah. Great. Um, well, a few more questions for you. Um, yeah. and then I, I think we've covered a lot of ground on EMDR yeah. has been yes. eye opening. Um, mm -hmm. what, what forms are of, of therapy is EMDR commonly paired with? Yeah. Well, I would say, um, 
Well, it's, it's another really great question. So EMDR is an integrative therapy, meaning it can certainly be done on its own to wonderful effect. There's a certain amount of talk therapy that's actually built into EMDR, but very commonly people will pair EMDR therapy with their regular talk therapy work. So in other words, they'll contact me or my therapy center where we have that um, large, large staff of clinicians for adjunctive EMDR work, meaning a course of treatment that they'll do in addition to their regular talk therapy work with their established therapist. And frankly, I love when this happens because then people get the um, the experience of the safety, the stability, and the secure attachment with their regular therapist to maybe help them process what they discover and move through in this specialty trauma work with EMDR. So I would say that EMDR pairs especially well um, with talk therapy if you know if you have a regular mm-hmm. uh, talk therapist. Yeah, I did it with you know, a talk therapist. And before we actually did a little bit of exposure response therapy mm-hmm. that was kind of like phobia oriented. And for me, yeah. it ended up being, I think like a really nice on-ramp yeah. into EMDR, especially around the, the more difficult memories. I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then one thing I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out there just on the subject of forms of treatment, because I, I hear this so mm-hmm. much from now the the circle that I'm in of people that are reading my writing and what have you is there's a, a lot of people ask me questions about psychedelics because that's mm-hmm. you know kind of the craze and there's a lot of momentum and interesting mm-hmm. research behind it and I'll say that just from my personal experience it played a very important role in my mm-hmm. overall journey mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I noticed that and what I'll say to folks is I'll first ask them like well what are you trying to work through often mm-hmm. there's something trauma related. And I'll say, have you heard of EMDR first? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Because from my personal experience, and again, I'll say my personal experience is that I actually found EMDR to be the perfect preparation for a large psychedelic dose. Yeah. A lot of clients find that. Yeah. And and that the psychedelic may not even be necessary. And and Mm -hmm. also it doesn't work for everyone. And so... Mm -hmm. And there's more history and literature around EMDR than there is for psychedelics. And so I'd say like, and more practitioners and it's legal, you know, (laughs) and so all those things. (laughs) So I'll usually, for for anyone who's listening, if you think about psychedelics, I'm not, me, Andy, I'm not saying no, but (laughs) check out EMDR first. There are other things that you can do. (laughs) Well, I I so appreciate it. You know, I think, I think it's really important for, um, anyone who's listening and for prospective clients who want to resolve their trauma or, you know, really even just move towards healing to understand that many roads lead to Rome, so to speak, right? EMDR is one road. It's a gold standard evidence-based trauma treatment endorsed by the World Health Organization. So it's a pretty (laughs) incredible road to take if you would like to resolve distressing symptoms, be they trauma related or other. other. Um, But it's not the only road. I mean, people can find healing and value in a safe long-term relationship with a traditional talk therapist or through other trauma treatment modalities, such as trauma-focused CBT or brain spotting or psychedelics or ketamine, right? Um, It's really important that people find something that works for them and their lives, right? It may not be very much of an option for, you know, a 40 year old woman with two kids under four to, you know, go on some massive psychedelic journeys at this stage in her life. Right. And so there are other options. Um, and it's just really important to, to know that, you know, as much as I'm obviously a proponent of EMDR, I'm just a, a larger proponent of finding the treatment modality that suits you and, and your life right now. Amen. Amen. It's, I mean, we, it's similar to my view in that, you know, I look at us and, and, we know this at this point, genetically, we come into this world and we're all unique and, you know, you can sequence the, the genome from uh, a woman's eggs and from a man's sperm and you can find everything's unique. Yeah. And on, on top of that, not only do we come into this world unique, born with certain predispositions, but then we have a unique set of experiences that shape and mold us. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, the heterogeneity of individuals and their experiences is one of the reasons why it's such a hard job as a psychotherapist to try and like, you know, figure it out for somebody 
is every mm-hmm. case is different. And at the end of the day, you're exactly right. Is um, I was speaking with a, a practicing Buddhist who's a farmer in, in Northern Thailand. I was in Thailand in September uh, mm. doing some volunteer work. And mm. he said something very similar. He said, everyone wants to get to Bangkok. The problem mm. is they're trying to copy somebody else's road to Bangkok. You've got to find mm-hmm. your own. Oh, and, right. and so all that is to say is like, for those who are listening, this process is unique to you. And part of it is discovering that unique combination of therapies and services and experiences that ends up unlocking the the sort of path of the journey that you want for yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. I could not agree with you more. And one thing I will add to that, because I really feel like this is just such a, it's a barrier that gets in the way of people seeking out help is believing it's too late, right? It's too late for me to take that road. It's too late for me to get to Bangkok, right? No. No, uh, it's, it's never, ever too late. No matter where you're starting from, it's never too late to change. It's, it's not just the tagline of my own therapy center. It's, it's literally <laughs> neuroscience, right? Advances yeah. in neuroscience and neuroimaging have shown us that the brain is plastic and we can change literally up until the moment we die. We can change mm-hmm. until our very last breath. So mm-hmm. no matter how traumatic your past experience is, no matter how hopeless you feel about the possibility of things being better, neuroscience suggests change is possible for you, Mm -hmm. for me, for all of us. And, you know, my job as a trauma therapist and my team's job at my therapy center is is just to help our clients achieve the changes they want to see in the way that works for them, because they are the expert of their experiences, not us. We're Mm -hmm. just the experts at the modalities that can help them get to Bangkok in the way they want to get to Bangkok. That's brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Okay. I think, uh, I think we've covered a lot here. I mean, if, uh, I guess the last question would be if there's any final things you want to share on EMDR and how folks can reach you and your team and your services, you know, feel free to, to share that. But yeah, I guess the yeah. floor is yours for this last part. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to thank you so, so much. I mean, talk about like the fastest hour ever. It's just a delight <laughs> to be with you. Yeah. And I am so grateful for all you're doing to elevate the conversation about mental health and certainly mental health and tech and mental health and entrepreneurs. It feels like such a uh, an under-discussed topical area. So thank you for all you're doing, Andy. And, you know, if anyone, after having listened to us today, is curious about EMDR, even remotely considering the possibility of working with an EMDR therapist, I'd be delighted to be a a personal resource to any of your listeners. Um, You can find me either at www.anywright.com or my therapy center is Evergreen Counseling. So it's www.evergreencounseling.com. We're located in Berkeley, but we see clients all up and down California. And we have a dedicated full-time clinical intake coordinator who you can just have an exploratory conversation with to see if there's a therapist on staff who might be a good fit for you. Because as you were talking about, you know, the number one uh, thing that makes therapy effective is fit. So we take a lot of pride in matching uh, clients with therapists that can fit them. And we can also share more information that I've written up and um, that I've really uh, taken a long time to um create about EMDR so that people can have all the information they need to make a really informed choice. We'd be delighted to be of service if there's a part of you that's wanting to change after listening to today's conversation. Great. And I'll, and I'll, I'll also make sure for the folks that are listening, I'll put um, those, those links in the show notes as well. So you can find it there. Uh, Well, thank you again, Annie. I I really appreciate you sharing your expertise and experience. It's going to help a lot of people. So thank you. I'm honored. Thank you so much for having me.